Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, the next session of the APDR National Virtual Noon Conference Series. Uh, my name is Dr. Hart Beatty. I'm the chair of the Education Committee for the APDR and the Neuroradiology Fellowship Director at Boston University. Uh, welcome everybody to week 16 of uh, a great program that we've had. Uh, today, again, we welcome two amazing speakers uh, and educators in our field, uh, a couple housekeeping items uh, to start us off. As you know, the webinars are being recorded and are being hosted on the APDR YouTube channel uh, to be uh, viewed anytime for free. Um, the questions and comments are also being recorded with the video uh, feed. Uh, we are muting the attendees' microphones to ensure optimal quality for the participants. And if you do have questions for our presenters, we ask that you use the Q&A tool in the Zoom platform, and we will do our best to get those questions answered um, uh, at, uh, over email, more than likely. Uh, so I would love to introduce our two speakers for today. Uh, first, we have Hakel Alencar, uh, Assistant Professor of Radiology at Brigham Health and Harvard Medical School, who will be speaking on female pelvic MRI and case review, and Anna Lorenko. Dr. Lorenko is an associate professor of radiology at Brown University and the Radiology Residency Program Director, and she'll be speaking second on OBGYN ultrasound pitfalls. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Alan Carr uh, to share her screen. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here today and welcome all participants. Uh, slide I have no disclosure, no conflict of interest to report for this lecture. Uh, if I could take a minute for you to answer a few questions to understand the audience a little better, and there will be just a couple of questions throughout uh, the talk to make it a little bit more interactive. If you have a web-based device, uh, your cell phone, computer, if you could please type poev.com slash Raquel Alinka. 799. Uh, I would appreciate to if you could answer a few questions so I would understand a little more about the audience and there'll be a few questions. Uh, so again, poev.com slash Raquel Alinka 799. Um, so if you can go on the internet and on that website and if you can answer again, uh, you can text as well. Um, so we have uh, some results coming in. We have 19, uh, 20 participants now, um, and most of them have used uh, POEV everywhere before. So again, the website is poev.com slash Raquel Aleka 799. And we have over 30 participants. Uh, so thank you for those who answered. Uh, I wanna just know uh, from where the people uh, are participating from. Uh, if you can tell the city you are or the country if you are outside of the US. Uh, so uh, some people from New York, uh, Chicago, Detroit, um, so pretty much um, all over the US. Um, so mostly uh, within the US, Miami, New York and uh, throughout. So. That's excellent, so welcome all. Uh, we have over 30 participants. And what year of training you are, uh, whether you're first year resident, second year resident, third year resident, uh, last year fellow, or you finished your training. So most are in, the, in their residency in the earlier years, uh, first, second, or third. So I'll make sure I will make comments appropriately and uh, so we will start with a pelvic MRI. And so in the next 25 minutes, uh, discussing a few cases. Uh, for pelvic MRI, the most important sequence is the T2 weighted sequence. We have an axial image uh, on the left, uh, a coronal image on the right. And the with T2 weighted image, you can nicely see the anatomy of the pelvic organs. Uh, for instance, in the ears, you can see all the layers, uh, such as the myometrium, the junctional zone, the endometrial cavity. In the ovary, you can see the follicles uh, in the right ovary here. So this is your bread and butter sequence that you'll be using um, to primarily interpret uh, pelvic MRI. Uh, and today we'll be talking about female pelvic MRI. 
So I'll go back to this case later, but the urine body and cervix uh, uh, on MRI uh, T2-weighted sequences. So I'll review a few cases. Uh, in this patient, you have an axial T2 image of the pelvis and at the level of the ears, uh, you can see the ears is not uh, as you, normal as the previous case. Uh, you can see the myometrium is filled with masses that have low signal on T2 and they are relatively circumscribed and they were intermediate signal on T1 and they enhanced. So the first question you ask is like, where is the location of those masses? Uh, what could they be and how to describe them? So it's key that to notice that they are circumscribed, dark on T2, and they are both within the myometrium. They are into the, protruding into the endometrium and some of them are even bulging outside. So this appearance is classic for urine leiomyomas or fibroids. Uh, they tend to be dark on T2, circumscribed, and you classify them based on their location within the ears as intramural, as most of the time, within the myometrium, as you can see here, or subserosal when they protrude outside, or submucosal. Uh, depending on their location, treatment and symptoms uh, can be different. For instance, patients that have infertility or abnormal bleeding, a submucosal fibroid is likely the culprit. Um, whereas uh, if the patient has a subserosal fibroid, that would not cause uh, any infertility issue, but it could cause bulky symptoms, compress adjacent organs. And the treatment uh, also will be different uh, depending on the location. If you have a submucosal fibroid, you could use a hysteroscopic approach to remove. If you have uh, intramural fibroids, you could use myomectomy or urine fibroid embolization. So it's crucial that this is a common entity of a pelvic MRI that you are familiar with the classic appearance of leiomyomas that you report the location, whether submucosal, intramural, or subserosal, when within the ears. This case is, has similar signal intensity. So it's another pelvic MRI. On the left, you have a T2-weighted axial image. On the right, you have a T1 post-contrast. And you have masses that are similar to the ones we saw. The ears was in the center, and it was they were outside the ears but they have very similar signal intensity with the slightly decreased T2 signal and circumscribed borders. So this is a, a, a leiomyomatosis in peritonealis disseminata. So you have leiomyomas throughout the peritoneum. So leiomyomas can happen in the ears, in which case you tell the location, so mucosal, intramural, subserosal, uh, but they can happen outside of the ears, uh, whether in the broad ligament, uh, and in the peritoneum itself. And this is a extreme rare case of perit leomyomatosis peritonealis disseminata throughout the peritoneum. It's a benign entity that uh, usually recurs locally and it's uh, aggressive because of the recurrence. So in summary, the location uh, we described within the ears, extra urine and diffuse uh, uh, within the peritoneum. This is another urine mass. You can see on the left axial T2 weighted sequence, the ears and the endometrial stripe are pushed anteriorly with the junctional zone with normal thickness. And this large single mass originating from the posterior aspect of the ears. On this sagittal image, you can see the endometrial stripe on this T2 weighted sequence and this large being deviated to the uh, anterior aspect and the large mass posteriorly it has higher signal on T2 than the cases we just saw. Uh, it has intermediate T1 signal uh, and it's diffusely enhancing. So it's another urine mass that's uh, very circumscribed and it's a leiomyoma. But in this case, the signal is greater than the usual because it's a hypercellular uh, leiomyoma or fibroid. Uh, so we usually see muscular uh, cells and some fibroidic tissue. Uh, in this case, you have not much fibrosis and hence the increased T2 signal. So the leiomyomas can undergo 
uh, different types of degeneration and you can have different types of appearances on MR. Uh, one of the appearances is a hypercellular leiomyoma that is increased signal T2. You still have that circumscribed appearance. There is no, uh, there's homogeneous enhancement. So there is no aggressive behavior. The main differential diagnosis here would be with a leiomyosarcoma in which uh, the three main features you look to differentiate a leiomyoma from a leiomyosarcoma is the heterogeneous appearance, the indistinct borders and the rapid growth. So you differentiate a leiomyoma from leiomyosarcoma by looking again for heterogeneous enhancement and heterogeneous signal, indistinct borders and rapid growth, which was not the case here. So this was diagnosed as a hypercellular fibroid. This is a patient that um, she uh, was pregnant, had some pain, delivered, and then came back uh, to have a pelvic MRI. And we see an urine mass. This is an axial T2-weighted sequence and the endometrial stripe is deviated to the right. This is a sagittal image again, and different uh, than the other cases we saw, there's a dark uh, T2 mass. It's very circumscribed as the previous uh, lesions we saw, and has a darker rim within that lesion. And when you look at the T1 pre-contrast, has a very high signal, and on post-contrast, there is no enhancement. So what do you think will be the diagnosis here? It looks like a fibroid, it's circumscribed. That's the most common uh, primary benign urine lesion. It's a leiomyoma, but it's, the signal is too dark and it's bright on T1 and not enhancing. So we discussed about some possible degenerations that can happen, and this is one of them. It's called red or hemorrhagic degeneration. It tends to occur in the pregnant patient and it can be associated to severe pain. So you have that hemorrhagic content, hence the increased signal on T1-weighted images, and there's no enhancement uh, uh, confirming this is just hemorrhagic red degeneration of the fibroid, uh, again, more commonly seen in pregnant patients. This is another uh, patient with a urine mass. You have T2-weighted sequences on the top, T1 pre and post on the bottom, and you have a mass that's bulging within the endometrial uh, cavity. You can see that has intermediate T2 signal. Uh, despite it being large, it's very circumscribed. It's homogeneous and it's homogeneously enhancing. And it, it had been slowly growing. So it's not a leiomyosarcoma. So it's likely a leiomyoma fibroid. The, the next step is to describe the location and enhancement pattern. So it was a submucosal uh, fibroid or leiomyoma as it bulged in the endometrial cavity and it was enhancing. So this patient uh, had abnormal bleeding, did not want to have surgery, ended up choosing to have uh, urine fibroid embolization and it uh, was uh, performed well. But the patient came back with severe pain and abnormal bleeding and passing uh, necrotic tissue through the vagina. So an MRI was ordered and you have a T2 weighted on the top, T1 pre and post on the bottom. Uh, this was a couple of weeks after the urine fibroid embolization. And you can see that you have the fibroid in the submucosal fibroid much smaller now, and there is no longer enhancement. It has a high signal on the T1 weighted sequence with no enhancement. So what's happening here? This patient underwent urine fibroid embolization and it got necrotic, so the very good response. But a complication that can happen with submucosal fibroids is that the patient can start to deliver those fibroids. You start passing those fibroids. And uh, this is a complication that can occur. The patients are at higher risk for infection. We observed this patient closely. We told her of the chance of infection if she had fevers uh, to go back. So she ended up passing all the fibroid, uh, but some patients may require hysteroscopic resection. So hence the importance of describing the location of the fibroid because large submucosal fibroids, when treated with urine fibroid embolization, they may uh, undergo necrosis and uh, the patient may end up passing the fibroid. So this was a myoma post embolization that the patient was passing. So this case is another pelvic MRI, T2 weighted sequences on the top and left and T1 on the right. You can see that the years is enlarged 
um, here, we don't see the junctional zone well. We have a circumscribed lesion that's similar to the first case we saw. There was a dark homogeneous circumscribed uh, lesion in the, in the myometrium here, classical fi fibroid or lyomyoma. But additionally, you have this indistinct aspect of the junctional zone with this T2 foci throughout it. So what do you think is a diagnosis? So it's a combination of a lyomyoma and adenomyosis. So we have thickening of the junctional zone that measures greater than 10 millimeters with associated multiple T2 foci throughout the thickened junctional zone. This is a companion case. Uh, the junctional zone in the right has normal thickness, but the junctional zone of this axial T2 weighted sequence is thickened, focally thickened, and different than the lyomyomas we saw, it has indistinct borders. And that darker area with indistinct borders has bright T2 foci within it. So what's the diagnosis in this case? It's focal adenomyosis. So it's an adenomyoma, if you will. So the main differential diagnosis in, of these lesions is uh, whether it's a lyomyoma versus an adenomyoma. The lyomyoma can be surgically resected. If it is were a lyomyoma and the patient had infertility issues, that probably would be the treatment. Whereas if it's adenomyosis or adenomyoma, they are not a surgical lesions. And uh, it would be terrible if this patient were to undergo uh, 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 myomectomy. Uh, these are, it's a, a process that needs to be treated either with serectomy uh, or some hormonal uh, therapy. And you make the distinction of adenomyoma from lyomyoma. Again, lyomyomas tend to be circumscribed homogeneously dark, whereas adenomyoma or focal adenomyosis tends to have indistinct borders and multiple T2 foci uh, within the area. So, uh, we already discussed that uh, finding. So with that, we discussed the uh, most common primary benign urine lesion, that's a lyomyoma, and some variants that can happen. Uh, and the main differential diagnosis, that's lyoadenomyoma. Uh, we are now moving on to cystic lesions of the female pelvis. So it, it's like real estate, location, location, location. So depending where the cystic lesion is located, you are able to make your diagnosis or narrow your diagnosis. So again, we have a sagittal image of the pelvis. You have a retroverted uterus, nice junctional zone, myometrium and endometrial stripe with cervix. And the pelvis uh, is divided in three main compartments. You have the anterior compartment, that's the bladder and urethra. We have, you have the middle compartment with the ureus, cervix, and vagina here. And the posterior compartment that you have the rectum and the anus here. So depending within these areas, uh, particularly talking about the female pelvis, uh, within whether cervix, vagina, upper, mid-vagina, lower vagina, urethra, uh, or vulva region, uh, you'll be able to make the diagnosis of those cystic lesions. So this is an axial T2-weighted sequence. You have the bladder, the ureus, with the endometrial stripe, and cervix. Then you have a cystic lesion, a uh, small cystic lesion in the cervix. This is the classic um, diagnosis of an abothian cyst. It's very common tends to occur due to obstruction of the glands that we see in the cervix, and they are benign with usually no symptoms. This is another case that you had the ureus was the one that I was showing the anatomy, and you see those cystis, cystic lesions uh, on T2 and T1 post contrast, that they are small cysts and multiple of them in the cervix. So it could be many in both cysts that are too many. Um, when I looked at this, I was concerned that there could be some enhancement. So I raised the possibility of being an adenoma malignum. malignum. I called the team to see if the patient had watery discharge, there was no symptoms, they ended up being a bi doing a biopsy because I thought these septa were enhancing, and they end up on pathology being just a conglomerate of nabothian cysts. But the main differential diagnosis here would be adenoma malignum, in which we describe as usually those nabothian cysts going crazy uh, when you have multiple nabothian cysts with some enhancement, some solid components. Uh, it's a spectrum of malignancy uh, that 
patients usually present with watery discharge through the vagina. But this particular case ended up being multiple cysts um, in the cervix consistent with both in system pathology. So again, the location of the, the cysts were in, was in the cervix. In this case, we have axial T2 on the top and axial T1 post contrast on the bottom. You have a small cystic lesion. Again, on the axial, we have the anterior compartment here, the urethra, the mid compartment, the vagina, and the posterior compartment, the anorectal junction here. And this cyst is located in which area? So if you look here and you have this cyst, so this cyst is located in the vagina. So you have the vagina wall here, and this cyst is within the vagina wall. So it's not in the urethra, it's not in the anus, it's in the vagina at the level of the pubic symphysis. So this is the classic location of the Gardner duct cyst, it's a developmental cyst that originates from the upper or mid vagina wall. It tends to be paramedian. And that's the uh, location that makes you do, make the diagnosis. This is a companion case of a larger cyst. Again, a cystic lesion, it's bright on T2, has no enhancement on T1 post contrast. When you look at the three compartments, you have urethra, vagina, and the anus. And this lesion is located in the vagina wall, is a paramedian cyst within the vagina wall at the level of the pubic symphysis. So it's kind of mid to upper vagina. So this is again, another Gartner duct cyst, a developmental cyst that's benign, usually has no symptoms. This patient was feeling a lump. That's why she was imaged and uh, diagnosis could be uh, made. This is another companion case showing in the vagina wall. This is the lumen of the vagina. Again, urethra, vagina, and anus, and the cyst is within the vagina wall, paramedian location at the level of the pubic symphysis or above it. So it's uh, another Gardner duct cyst. Now moving down, you have a sagittal T2 on the right, axial T2 on the left, and T1 post contrast on the bottom. You can appreciate that you have the ears with a large submucosal fibroid, dark circumscribed lesion. You have the cervix, you have the vagina, and you have that cystic lesion lower, so it's below the pubic symphysis, it's close to the uh, introitus, and you have the labia majora here, and you have that cyst that's not enhancing on T1. Again, the labia majora, that's the introitus vaginalis, and you have that cystic lesion, paramedian, much lower than the Gardner cysts we're seeing that tends to occur in the upper or mid vagina. This is just inferior to the vagina, again, close to the labia majora. So what do you think is the diagnosis here? It's a Bartholin gland cyst. So you have a Bartholin gland on each side uh, of the vagina, vaginal introitus and just underneath the labia majora. And cysts can develop because the duct of the gland can obstruct and cysts can form, or uh, you can have associated infection as a complication and those uh, cysts can develop and given the classic location, you can make the uh, Bartholin gland cyst diagnosis. If there is infection, associated infection, then they need to be drained and marsupialized uh, so it doesn't recur. These cysts are in a slightly different location. They are below the pubic symphysis. Uh, so is it a Bartholin gland cyst? But they're actually more anteriorly located. located. They are not in association with the labia majora and the vaginal introitus. This is the vagina here, but they're more associated to the urethra and the urethra opening. So you have two cysts. This is the urethra just next to the urethra. So what do you think is a diagnosis on this case? So cystic lesion below the pubic symphysis adjacent to the urethra orifice. So that, that's the classic location for the skin gland cyst. They are just next to the opening of the urethra and more anterior than the Bartholin gland cyst and again below the pubic symphysis. So because of this classic location, you can make the diagnosis of a skin gland cyst. We have another cystic lesion. Uh, you see the urethra, vagina, and anus, or in a rectal junction with the puberatalis muscle here, T2, axial T2 weighted sequence, axial T1 weighted sequence, and you have sagittal T2 and coronal T2. And you can see that coma-shaped structure. So if you can answer the poll, where do you think this cyst is originating from? 
Is it from the vagina wall, from the urethra, from the rectum, from vulva, or none of the above? So you have a cyst, um, I can try to show the, uh, the image again, uh, people are debating between vagina wall and urethra and, and those and people are changing back and forth, uh, something is in the vulva. So it's uh, exactly the challenge here because you see the urethra and you see the uh, vagina wall and that cyst is in the urethral vaginal space. So it's pushing the vagina and it's originating from the urethra. So if you see this beak, that coma-shaped appearance, is the beacon of the connection of within the urethra. So it's actually originating from the urethra, and the loose space that it has to grow is within the urethral vaginal space. So that cyst grows giving that coma-shaped appearance. It's a tight space anteriorly, so that's the only loose space that it has to grow. It originates from the urethra, as you can see here, that's the beak, and then it grows uh, into the urethral vaginal space, giving that coma-shaped appearance. So this patient had posed void dripping. She would go to the bathroom void and then had some dripping after. And that classic location and coma-shaped appearance can make you uh, establish a diagnosis of urethral, urethral diverticulum. You have another case that's a smaller lesion, but again, always that classic coma-shaped appearance that the cyst that grows in the urethral vaginal space and tends to be proximal to mid-urethra. So it's at the level of the pubic symphysis. Again, the cyst that grows from the urethra, coma-shaped into the urethral vaginal space as you can see here on this T2 and on this T1 post contrast, a smaller one than the one we just saw. And then to wrap up and finish, we have another cyst. Uh, in this case, it's lower. You have a coronal image. You have the labia majora here. Um, so it's close to the Bartholin gland, but it's not in the, at the level of the introitus. It's more anteriorly located. So it's a cyst bright on T2, dark on T1, post contrast, not enhancing. And the cyst was actually elongated. You could see that it's like extending almost to the peritoneum uh, cavity. Uh, that's hard to depict on those uh, single images. But this is a rare uh, developmental cyst from the canal of NUC. So canal of NUC cyst is like the female hydrocele. This patient presented feeling a lump in her vulva, in her labia majora. And when we did the MR, we could see this elongated cystic lesion in the labia that was connecting uh, to the processus vaginalis of the female. So that remains open and cysts can accumulate there, causing the female hydrocele or canal of neck uh, cyst. Um, this is another case. The patient actually had head surgery. They didn't remove everything. It's like hydrocele that it can recur. You have Again, the cyst is elongated along the labia majora. You have within the labia, the cyst that connects uh, within the canal of NUC, uh, the female hydrocele or canal of NUC uh, cyst. So I think with this, um, we, uh, you have any questions, but we discussed uh, some of the female pelvic MRI findings in the years. We focused on the common urine fibroid lyomyoma, uh, some differential diagnosis, adenomyomas, and different presentations of lyomyomas. And we also discussed the pelvic uh, female cysts, and depending on the location, you can make the diagnosis. So I hope you have enjoyed the presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions via the, the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Alan Carr, for a really wonderful presentation. Um, My pleasure. I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Lorenko to uh, share your screen and begin your presentation, please. Wonderful. So welcome, everyone. I'll be speaking on OBGYN ultrasound pitfalls. I have no disclosures. And our goals are going to be to review um, and to be able to recognize common gynecological ultrasound uh, pitfalls and describe strategies to avoid these. And of course, we'll do a variety of cases along the way. 
So our first case is a 36 year old who was transferred to our uh, emergency department for acute right lower quadrant pain. The outside ultrasound report actually did accompany the patient in this case and noted a left ovarian cyst and echogenic right adnexal mass. And so what we see on our repeat ultrasound images, we have sagittal views of the left ovary that look pretty unremarkable. And then we have views of the right ovary. And you can see here the ovary is um, enlarged, measuring uh, eight by six centimeters. There's a dominant cyst. And the peripheral uh, parenchyma looks somewhat heterogeneous and uh, echogenic. And then the sonographer in this case was actually very astute and took this nice transverse image showing us the uterus and appropriately labeling the right ovary, which was located in the left pelvis. So automatically that's a tip off that something is awry, right? And then this additional nice image showing the right ovary distinct from the left ovary. So you've got the two ovaries together over in the left side of the pelvis, a patient with acute pain. There is some fluid in the cul-de-sac. The color views of this right ovary here um, do still show some arterial um, tracings and some blood flow. And so the interpretation um, overnight was that this was suspicious for ovarian torsion. Uh, for whatever reason, the uh, referring provider was not convinced that that patient actually had torsion and ordered an MRI. And so these are um, axial and coronal T2 weighted images. We can see the uterus here. We can see the right ovary again with that dominant cyst, peripheral follicles, there's free fluid in the pelvis. And on the coronal view, you can see a little bit of a twisting of the vascular pedicle. And also note that the uterus is deviated to the right of midline. Deviation to the side of an ovarian torsion is a well-described uh, imaging finding and something that we should look for. So indeed, um, this patient um, has an ovarian torsion. These are some additional images, again, showing the right ovary located in the left pelvis and normal looking left ovary adjacent. And then these are the post contrast subtracted T1 images that show there's really not much enhancement at all um, within this torsed right ovary. So what's the pitfall here? The pitfall here is that flow on color Doppler tracings does not exclude the possibility of ovarian torsion. And in this case, when we reviewed it in a QA setting and spoke to the um, GYN provider that was involved in the case, that is one of the reasons that the provider said, well, it can't be torsion because there's still flow. And so we as imagers need to be very aware that color flow does not exclude torsion. And the reasons for that is that you can have incomplete or intermittent torsion, and the ovary can have some accessory blood supply. And so really, if the grayscale appearance is suspicious for torsion and the patient's clinical presentation is suspicious for torsion, those patients should be explored surgically, regardless of what the color Doppler uh, images show and what the tracings are. So what is the clinical presentation for adnexal torsion? So it's generally a very rapid onset of pain, often associated with nausea, vomiting, sometimes a low-grade fever, leukocytosis, and the presence of an adnexal mass. And what are the risk factors? So a dominant mass is certainly a risk factor. An enlarged ovary, so an ovary over uh, five centimeters in size in one dimension or over 20 um, cc's in volume, and sometimes that we'll see that with um, fertility patients if they have hyperstimulated ovaries. And ovarian torsion is most common in women of reproductive age. So let's review the sonographic um, findings of torsion because this is an important and um, unfortunately not, um, not an infrequent miss as far as diagnosis in both the emergency department and um, GYN. So an enlarged and heterogeneous ovary is the most common finding. So we can see here again, this ovary is upwards of eight centimeters in size. The grayscale appearance is very heterogeneous look to it and we can see some peripheral follicles. The whirlpool sign has been described on ultrasound and you look for that using um, color and it's essentially a twisting of the vascular pedicle. So when you see it, it's a very nice finding to support a diagnosis of torsion, but it is a bit difficult to demonstrate on ultrasound. Sometimes cine images are helpful um, in that regard and certainly at our institution, the technologists routinely do take cine images through the adnexa. 
what else can we see? So the follicles move per peripherally. So as the blood supply to the ovary is um, compromised, it's the soft and squishy vein that is compressed first. The artery walls have more muscle to them. They're not compressed as readily. And so you're in a situation where you're still having blood inflow to the ovary, but very limited blood outflow. So that makes the ovary swell in size and that parenchyma gets more echogenic and heterogeneous and the follicles are pushed peripherally and there's often associated free fluid as we see here. An ovarian mass is certainly a risk factor as we talked about. So in this case, this woman's ovary is nearly 15 centimeters in size with a dominant central cyst. You see the remainder of the follicles are pushed peripherally. Um, and this was another case of torsion. In this case, this woman happened to be pregnant and uh, pregnancy is also another risk factor. The elevated progesterone levels found in pregnancy contribute to ligamentous laxity. Um, and the corpus luteum of pregnancy frequently present in the first trimester can serve as a lead point for torsion. So we're not gonna do a formal audience response, but I figured I would ask uh, a question here based on the images of the right ovary, what's the most likely diagnosis for the eight week pregnant patient with severe right-sided pain? So I sort of let the horse out of the barn on that one, right? That was definitely um, a torsion on the prior case. So let's look at this one. So this person's ovary is about nine centimeters in size. There is venous and arterial flow on color Doppler but she's got acute pain and she's eight weeks pregnant. So do we think it's a corpus luteum of pregnancy, ovarian torsion, ovarian hyperstimulation, or a benign cystadenoma? Well, we've been talking about torsion and indeed this is another case of torsion. So again, you've got an enlarged ovary, you've got peripheral follicles. We talked about the not getting hung up on the Doppler findings. Um, so despite the presence of venous and arterial flow, this case was a surgically confirmed um, case of ovarian torsion. And in fact, it's important to note that many times the um, presence of flow actually may indicate an ovary that's still salvageable if they get the patient to the OR quickly enough. And in this case, they were able to detorse um, this ovary and save it. So we'll change gears now um, away from ovarian torsion. And um, one more question. So based on ultrasound images, what do you think is the cause of this patient's acute right-sided pelvic pain. So we have an image of the right kidney, an image of the bladder at the level of the uh, UVJ, and then a transverse image of um, both um, ureteral insertions into urinary bladder. So hydronephrosis of pregnancy, pyelonephritis, cystitis, or an obstructing distal ureter stone. In this case, this was actually an obstructing distal ureter stone. So you can see there's a little bit of fluid in the right upper quadrant by the kidney. There's probably been a calyceal rupture of an obstructed um, system under high pressure. When we look at the images of the bladder and where the ureter inserts, you see an echogenic focus in the UVJ with a twinkle artifact on the color images, and there's no jet. So this is an obstructing distal stone resulting in hydro. And certainly sometimes these patients can present with extreme pelvic pain and it may not be clear that it's renal colic as opposed to a gynecologic etiology. So it is something to think about and it is absolutely a diagnosis that we can make. Um, in addition, sometimes on the endovaginal images um, with ultrasound, we're able to see the shadowing stone right at the level of the UVJ. So here's our next case. We have a 22 year old with acute left-sided pelvic pain. And we have a left ovary here that looks fairly unremarkable and a right ovary that's a bit more heterogeneous in appearance with uh, what is likely a uh, hemorrhagic cyst or follicle within it. And then we go over into the left adnexa. And again, we see a sort of tubular hypoechoic structure leading up to an echogenic um, calculus. And so this is a distended ureter, um, again, with a four millimeter obstructing stone. And these are an example of what I just mentioned where on an endovaginal exam, you can sometimes make this finding and account for the patient's pain. So you'll remember the ovary on the left was normal. The right-sided ovary had a hemorrhagic follicle, which is physiologic in a premenopausal woman, but this distal left UVJ stone was the cause of the patient's pain. So how do these look at ultrasound? So distal ureteral stones are gonna be hyperechoic, um, shadowing, you may see a hypoechoic rim and certainly look for that Doppler twinkle artifact. Um, you know, ultrasound has a variable um, 
performance uh, sometimes for detecting renal calculi, but ureteral calculi within 35 millimeters of the UVJ were identified on transabdominal ultrasound with a very good sensitivity and specificity um, in this study from uh, a number of years back in radiology. So if you, if you know to look for them and you pay attention, um, you may certainly make this diagnosis with ultrasound. So we'll move on to our next case. We have a 27-year-old who presented with acute uh, lower abdominal pain, nausea, fever, vomiting. On exam, she was tender to palpation. Uh, she had cervical motion tenderness and she had purulent cervical discharge. She had a leukocytosis with a white count over 14,000 and differential diagnosis when the emergency provider evaluated the patient was appendicitis or tubovarian abscess and pelvic inflammatory disease. So the initial imaging selected was an ultrasound. So the ultrasound shows a normal uterus and normal um, ovaries. There is some free fluid in the right adnexa. And the patient was um, essentially diagnosed with PID, um, presumptively, despite um, denying a social history uh, that would put her at risk for any sexually transmitted infections. So she was sent home with routine um, antibiotics, and then she returned days later feeling significantly worse. And at that point, a CT was ordered from the emergency department. And these are images from that study showing some fluid in the right upper quadrant and showing pretty extensive inflammation in the right pelvis with associated free fluid and a um, sort of tubular uh, collection there in that right lower quadrant. When you looked at the coronal image, you could more convincingly see that there was a distended um, and hyper-enhancing inflamed appendix within that collection in the right lower quadrant. Um, and so this turned out um, to be a case of uh, actually ruptured appendicitis that uh, initially mimicked um, PID. And all of that inflammation from the pelvis was sort of making its way out um, via fallopian tube into the endometrial cavity and out the vagina, which explains why the patient had um, purulent cervical discharge in this case. So how does ultrasound perform for PID? So this study looked at 52 patients with clinical PID and um, ultrasound images, and um, nearly half had other diagnoses not related to genital infection. And um, six of those cases of non-genital um, infection were due to appendicitis with three of them diagnosed by ultrasound. So just be aware that sometimes appendicitis can present in this um, relatively tricky fashion. And so if it doesn't really fit for um, PID, there should be uh, an additional imaging study ordered and that um, most often is gonna be CT. And so um, for cases of PID, bilateral adnexal masses were the most common um, finding in over 80% of patients and much less common to see bilateral adnexal masses in patients who presented with other diagnoses. All right, so this is a 28-year-old who had left lower quadrant pain for three months and gets a pelvic ultrasound as initial imaging. And we can see that in the left adnexa, there's a little bit of fluid. There's some bowel loops that look somewhat thickened. And so we were wondering that if this was a bowel process, not a um, gynecologic process and suggested, well, hey, maybe you should get a CT. And turns out when we called the emergency providers and told them that maybe she should get a CT, they were like, oh yeah, she's got Crohn's disease. And so these are the CT images. And so she has really extensive inflammatory changes in that left lower quadrant. We were just seeing the sort of tip of the iceberg by ultrasound, and this was indeed just a um, Crohn's disease flare. This is another woman who presented um, with adnexal fullness and tenderness and right lower quadrant pain for two weeks. So again, we see on the endovaginal ultrasounds, the ovary looks pretty good. There's some normal follicles, but um, immediately adjacent to that ovary is this sort of heterogeneous tubular area that we were wondering, you know, could this be um, a dilated fallopian tube in the setting of a um, pyosalpinx um, or um, other process? And so we suggested additional imaging beyond that. So she got a um, CT, which again showed this distended tubular structure uh, containing an appendicolith and even a little bit of uh, adjacent extraluminal air. So this was a ruptured appendicitis with an abscess and 
what we were seeing on ultrasound was some of that um, abscess and thick walls of that collection. All right, so we'll change gears again, move on from the non-gynecologic um, diagnoses. And so this is our next case. It's a 40-year-old woman with acute onset of pelvic pain. And the transabdominal images show the uterus and both adnexa, and then an image with some question marks. And so it's always worrisome when the technologist starts to label things with question marks. That makes me very uneasy. And so there's this mass that was maybe next to the ovary, couldn't quite tell um, from initial images. So on CT, um, we see that there's quite a bit of fluid in this woman's pelvis. We see the uterus, we see the bladder anteriorly, but we see this uh, mass posterior to the uterus and some active extravasation on the post-contrast images. Um, similarly here on the coronal, you can see there's quite a bit of hemoperitoneum extending up into Morrison's pouch in the right upper quadrant. And this was a pretty large volume uh, hemoperitoneum due to a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. And so what's our pitfall here? So despite the fact that it's actually part of our standard pelvic ultrasound protocol to get images of both um, upper quadrants, this patient's ultrasound did not contain those images. And so we really had no idea um, how much fluid or blood was in her pelvis. If we had taken the time to do the quick upper quadrant images, it would have probably given us a pretty good indication that there was quite a bit of hemoperitoneum in this patient. And so most of the time, these hemorrhagic ovarian cysts will stop bleeding on their own. And if patients are hemodynamically stable, they will often elect observation. In this case, the patient had dropped her hemoglobin sufficiently and had become tachycardic that they elected to take her to surgery. But again, be aware that those right upper quadrant images are very important to de detect large volumes of fluid in the peritoneal cavity and take just a moment to obtain. So this is an example of an image where there's a large volume of fluid and you can see it pretty clearly in Morrison's pouch. All right, so our next case is a 55-year-old who presented with pelvic pain and fullness. Initial imaging was an ultrasound showing a pretty heterogeneous uterus and an indistinct and ill-defined mass in the right adnexa. This is what her follow-up MRI looked like. And so you can see there is an enormous, probably 20 centimeter uh, or more, um, solid and cystic mass in this patient's um, pelvis. And again, you'll note these are only endovaginal images, right? So we um, skipped the transabdominal images, went straight to endovaginal, saw the uterus, saw something we weren't quite sure of in the right adnexa. And had we taken the time to do the transabdominal images, I think we would um, very likely have seen this enormous mass. So again, the potential pitfall here is to remember that our transabdominal images really are important to give us a big picture um, lay of the land view for pelvic ultrasound. And so it is definitely worth your time to take those views. Here's our next case. We have a 23 year old with a positive beta who presented with pain and bleeding. So this time we did do the right upper quadrant images. You can see there's a little bit of fluid in Morrison's pouch. Your SAG views of the uterus show that there is um, a gestational sac in the uterus. There's also some complex um, free fluid with echoes located posterior to the uterus. And when we look more carefully, it looks like within that gestational sac in the uterus, there's probably an embryo. And in the right adnexa, there's this very heterogeneous um, mass measuring nearly six centimeters surrounded by complex fluid. So this case turned out to be a heterotopic pregnancy, so a simultaneous intrauterine and ectopic pregnancy. And so these are quite rare. Um, they are most commonly found in patients undergoing assisted fertility treatments with reports of an incidence of about one in 100. But in patients that are not undergoing fertility treatments, and this patient certainly was not and was only 23 years of age, they are extremely rare. Um, but clearly not impossible, right? So the, the re reports are about one in 30,000 for the non-assisted um, reproduction uh, patients. 
So this brings me to talk a little bit about unusual ectopics, right? So your standard, um, you know, at Nexel um, ectopic, you'll expect to see an adnexal mass separate from the ovary, sometimes with associated free fluid and no uh, evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy. Unusual ectopics are um, pretty uncommon. They comprise only 5% of ectopic pregnancies, but they are uh, potentially very deadly, accounting for 30% of the mortality. So these are entities that it is important to think about and that we need to remind ourselves about because even in practices where we're doing high volume OBGYN imaging, these do not occur that commonly in day-to-day -day practice. And so what are the unusual ectopics? So you can have a cervical ectopic, an interstitial ectopic, an ovarian ectopic, or abdominal um, ectopic, or a scar ectopic, and those are frequently related to prior um, C-section scars. So pitfalls is that we may not think about these in everyday practice. Um, and if we don't, then that's potentially quite problematic. So cervical ectopics, um, the gestational sac will be in the cervix. And the tricky part about these is you're trying to figure out sometimes, well, is this just an abortion in progress where this gestational sac is making its way out and we just happen to image it when it's in the cervix? Or is this truly a pregnancy that implanted in the cervix? and is growing here. And so there are a couple of tricks you can keep in mind in um, practice to help you answer that. And one is if you, if you can see movement of the gestational sac in the endocervical canal, then it's not an ectopic. Then it's just a sac making its way out and this is an abortion in progress. And sometimes, you know, using the transducer to see if you can um, make the sac move in that canal is helpful to demonstrate that and use some Cine images to help yourself as well. The other thing is that, you know, when a pregnancy is a cervical ectopic and it implants there and it's growing there, people have described this sort of figure eight configuration of the sac, which is what you're seeing in this image here on the left of our screen, where the sac is growing, but the endocervical canal is pretty tight and it ends up growing in this sort of figure eight type of shape. Certainly, if you've gotten to the point where you can see embryonic cardiac activity in the sac, then that's definitely not an abortion in progress. That's a cervical ectopic, but you may find these sooner um, than you would um, expect to have embryonic cardiac activity. And that is a pretty convincing yolk sac in that um, gestational sac. So interstitial ectopics. So sometimes you'll hear these referred to as corneal ectopics. That's not technically the right um, term. They're actually interstitial ectopics. So it's right as that fallopian tube inserts into the myometrium. And these are going to present as a mass and um, they can actually grow um, for quite a number of weeks more than your typical ectopic. So they may present at the 10, 12 week mark because there is a little bit of myometrium around them. And so again, we see here there's a mass, um, very peripherally located um, in the uterus. There's no actual intrauterine pregnancy, just a little bit of fluid. And you'll remember back to your anatomy that the um, uterine vessels sort of drape over the uterus right at the corneal um, aspects of the uterus. And so you might imagine that, you know, if these continue to grow and subsequently rupture, it can be really devastating as far as um, hemorrhage. And um, that's what leads to the potential fatalities. So this is a case that was actually appropriately diagnosed as an interstitial ectopic pregnancy, was treated with localized methotrexate injection. And then the patient presented days later with more extreme pain to the emergency department where she got a CT that shows that interstitial ectopic that's now ruptured and a considerable um, amount of hemoperitoneum. And so this went on to rupture despite um, a, a being treated with methotrexate. And then obviously from here, she went on to surgery. All right, and then ovarian ectopics. So these are, again, exceedingly rare. Um, the vast majority of the time when you see an ectopic pregnancy that you think might be ovarian, it turns out that it's just your run-of-the-mill adnexal ectopic pregnancy that's next to the ovary. And again, one of the tricks you can keep in mind is you're you know, either scanning yourself or asking your technologist to scan and get cine images. If you can demonstrate that the ectopic mass moves separately from the ovary, then that's your typical adnexal ectopic. Um, but in the case of an ovarian ectopic, you'll see the ectopic mass and the ovary and they will move together. And so in this case here, we can see there's a pretty convincing gestational sac with a yolk sac and peripheral vascularity. And it is embedded right in the ovarian parenchyma. You can see a little follicle 
um, within the ovary itself. This happened to be a patient who was undergoing assisted fertility treatments, um, and they were actually able to treat this ectopic pregnancy with localized injection of methotrexate and preserve her ovary. So very um, rare entity, but again, important to think about. So what are our take home po uh, points from this fast and furious lecture? So if you see an enlarged um, and heterogeneous ovary with or without a mass, think about torsion in the setting of acute pain. And remember that blood flow may be present. It can, you can sometimes document both venous and arterial flow, and that is because you can have incomplete or intermittent torsion or an accessory blood supply to the ovary. And also be prepared that you may have to be the one as the radiologist to really stick to your guns and say, yes, this is still suspicious for torsion despite the presence of vascular flow, because certainly that's a misconception amongst radiologists sometimes that vascular flow excludes torsion, but it is an um, equally common misconception amongst our gynecology um, and uh, emergency colleagues. So you need to really be aware of that and be ready to um, present it to your colleagues um, in a way that, that helps them understand um, why it is that you think this patient has torsion. So when you're doing OBGYN ultrasound, also be aware that there may be times when you diagnose non-gynecologic causes of pain. And so in particular, those can be the distal ureteral stones that we saw in these um, examples, as well as acute appendicitis, as we saw in some of the cases here. Remember that your upper quadrant images can be very helpful to quantify the amount of fluid in someone's peritoneal cavity. And remember that your transabdominal and transvaginal images are complementary and that those transabdominal images are sometimes quite important to give you a big picture view, a lay of the land. Um, if you go straight to the endovaginal images, you may miss the forest for the trees, so to speak. So I thank you so much for your attention, everyone. I think we are um, a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. I'll be happy to address um, questions on the Q&A feature. And thanks everyone for being here. Thank you, Dr. Lorenko and Dr. Alan Carr for two really great presentations. Um, uh, I think we'll wrap the session up. It looks like there are no questions at this point. Um, thank you again, both. Thanks to all the attendees. And we will join you again on Thursday for our next session on pediatric imaging. Thanks again, everybody, and be well.